Hi everybody, I'm William E. Harlan, or Billy, and this is Antioch, chapter 28, the third meridian. Ezekiel looked at himself in the mirror of a window-lit public restroom. He had failed. He could hold life in his hands, bend it into shapes, and even stop its flow, but he couldn't bring it back once it was gone. Not yet. He felt he'd come closer every time, with each of his daughters, and his son, and then his grandson. But resurrection remained just out of reach. There was an element he was missing. Perhaps the solution lies in those forbidden paths. But no, he wasn't insane with grief any more. He knew the dangers of those. In those paths, he risked himself. Venturing into them for Elizabeth had been a short-sighted mistake. She was going to die anyway, he told himself. Eventually. She never would have loved me if I'd just kept her alive. I've learned that much from the others. Truly, loving me was the only purpose she served. No, he'd simply have to try again within his boundaries. What was thirty years, anyway? He couldn't remember how old he really was, certainly much older than this man in the mirror. He imagined that if he were to look his age, he'd be no more than a fragile column of dust, ready to fall apart at the slightest breath of motion. He needed to change. The waitress out in the restaurant was pale and black-haired, He'd make himself look like that. He hadn't looked like that in a while. The color drained from his face, leaving a shade of waitress in its wake, down into his shirt collar. Under his clothes it did the same, pulling out of every surface and collecting into his left arm. That hand became darker and darker with lightness creeping down above it. The tip of the index finger began to distend, swelling with melanin like a blackberry. When he was almost an albino, he plucked his previous hue and left it on the sink encased in his fingerprint. He squeezed the basic structures out of his recent meal, began dissolving and growing bone, and sprouted straight and black hair under his old, tight and white curls. The skin elasticized on his strengthening frame as the materials of his appearance exchanged. The energy behind the shift was limitless. When he was finished, he took out a pair of scissors. He looked ridiculous. Ezekiel paid his tab as a different man with a sloppy haircut, and stepped outside into a warm breeze. The waitress queered out at him through the window. The restaurant was a quaint little building, with the bark still on its pillars, built cozily into a grove of trees. Seeking out the last of his blood relatives had taken Ezekiel deep into the country. An annoying stinging in his left eye made him squint. He brought his fingers up to rub it at first. When the irritation persisted, he examined his reflection. Something small and vicious was growing by division in his eye, rapidly. All of the great nation's militaries were either ignorant or at critical security. There was no in-between. The plague was faster than the post. Major cities across the continent evacuated on their own accord. The safest response, however, was to stay out of open air. General Alexander, his crisp uniform armored with decorations, led a group of soldiers and scientists from the headquarters of an underground system of bunkers. Those surrounding him were alive because of his quick and tough decisions. They were absolutely loyal to him and busy at their tasks ready for his orders. Then, suddenly, every one of them collapsed, hundreds across the room. In one moment, rifles clattered under combat fatigues, coffee arced from dropping cups, and papers spilled to the floor to float in low, slipping courses. Alexander stood alone in the middle of the event. He understood what had happened. It had been twenty years, but he'd seen it before. Ezekiel was coming. He considered drawing his pistol and holding it on the door, but he didn't and then the door opened, and Ezekiel came through in his latest disguise. The altered appearance didn't come as a surprise. Alexander had seen him in countless faces. He could only hope this version would be useful. Oh, Alex, thank everything you're all right. You're the first one I thought of when I found out what was happening. Alexander was unreceptive. Are they dead? Well, I don't know. Like I said, you're the first one I came to see. Alexander frowned and indicated his fallen company. Ezekiel said, Oh, that. No, they're asleep. What do you want? That's fairly obvious, isn't it? I'm here to help you. Good. I'm working on the best response to the plague, the best way to move around above ground, and the best way to aid the suffering holdouts on the surface. I assume you're immune to this disease. He strode to the wall map with his pointer. You can find and bring in survivors from Sector 7G. Ezekiel paused at having been given orders. But we can't bother with these he said, gesturing at the sleeping men and women. We have to find the others. They're in danger. Alexander put his hands behind his back. I don't care if they are. 
I'm not interested in abandoning my responsibilities. You can stay and help me with what I'm doing, or you can carry me out of here. Ezekiel was taken aback. He really means that. How sad. Alexander had always been his favorite, the oldest and wisest of his glorious immortals, his rare friends. He looks rather like a bellboy in that uniform. A fantastic genius of a bellboy. If he hadn't met me, he'd have ruled the world for a time. Ezekiel conceded. He had to hurry. The others needed and might even want his help. But before leaving, he'd do everything he could for this one. He found a pen and some paper in the mess and started writing. I won't do either, Alex. I know of a place where they can cure this, whatever this is. You should be safe at sea. He stopped and looked up. It's very far from here. Your only other option is to come with me. I'll take directions to the place, if that's the choice. Ezekiel sighed and went back to writing. Be careful with the men there. They're dangerous. They'll destroy you if they even suspect that I've instructed you. So, it's finally a good thing you never did. Alexander turned away to check on his soldiers. Like I said, even if they suspect, you must appear absolutely ignorant. Promise me you will do so. They're like you? Ezekiel's eyes darted. Somewhat. They're called the Circle. You must deliver them this secret note. No, have one of your... one of those give it to them. He flicked his fingers at the sleepers again and went back to writing. When did you last meet with them? The last time I collected my books from you, I suppose. When was that? He didn't look up from writing to ask. Alexander put his palm over his face. That was over two hundred years ago. Ezekiel seemed to have no concept of how long that was or how much could have changed. The great nations were little more than warring ethnic tribes two hundred years ago. The place in reference might be a wilderness or even a crater by now. Then again, outside of appearances, Ezekiel hadn't changed at all in much longer than that. Ezekiel took out a leather-bound journal from behind his back, the record of his latest work on resurrection, and put it on top of the two notes he'd written. This place, it's where I take the books. You do it this time, but remember, you don't know anything. Alexander nodded. Then Ezekiel said, Good luck, Alex, and left. Everyone started waking up when he was gone. They found Alexander sitting in study of what Ezekiel had left behind. The first note had directions in Continental that led to a land outside of Discovery, past the endless ocean's mythical third meridian, and ended in a place labeled Antioch. So, this is where he takes the books. How many times has he crossed this impossible distance? How does he do it? He flipped through the journal. It appeared to be yet another tedious volume of Ezekiel's psychotic babble. Alexander had secrets, too. He'd deciphered the script on his own long ago. He put the journal aside and read the second note to himself. Armageddon is arrived. That's the truth, no matter what you believe. Break your silence. Hmm. Open the library. He rubbed his face in contemplation. Corporal Lyons wobbled over to him, still recovering. Sir! What happened, sir? Alexander made up his mind right then. Send out my command to ready the fleet, Corporal. It's time to evacuate all non-essential personnel. He handed her the journal. Add this to my private collection and have all of it loaded onto the Vesper. She'll serve as a flagship. He handed her the directions. Give this to her captain and have him report to me immediately for briefing. I know it's slower, but use the tunnels from now on. He'd meant what he said. He wouldn't abandon his responsibilities. But if there was a safe place in the world, he knew of a few thousand refugees who deserved a shot at it. Lyons gave him a bleary salute and then looked at the directions. Her face opened with surprise. This leads across the third meridian. No one knows what's out that far. Alexander frowned at her. Do you need me to repeat your orders, Corporal? Lyons recovered herself at attention. Sir! No, sir! Carry them out. Sir! Yes, sir! The Grace was anchored off the coast. Captain, the only one aboard, lay back in a folding lounge chair on the front deck, with his long auburn waves and a greasy draggle. He'd a beautiful green macaw perched on the headrest behind him, and a brown bottle of rum in hand. He would spend weeks at a time out there in solitude, except for the company of his bird, drifting in and out of a drunken stupor. He offered her a soda cracker over his shoulder. What do you say there, Beatrice, if you drink and smoke yourself to death? That doesn't count as a suicide, now does it? He'd been asking her that all day. 
Beatrice held the treat in one foot, nibbled it, and whistled. Then she blasted out, ah, Smoke yourself to death! The shocking volume of it made Captain duck. Then he laughed, delighted with her. Why, that's a new one for you. There's a good girl. Beatrice didn't have a very large vocabulary. Captain thought that made what she said all the more important, so he took her advice and lit his pipe. He smoked for a good long while and fed crackers to his bird. She liked the salt in them. Near dusk, Ezekiel climbed over the railing, soaking wet like a devil out of the depths, and spluttered, Noah, think everything you're alive! Screech! Smoke yourself to death! Whistle! Ezekiel gasped at the bird. Captain didn't bother to look up. He'd gone by a lot of different names, but there was only one person left in the world who knew him as Noah. Cavaroy's Llama, what? You need money again already? Ezekiel said, No. Thought, Not this one, too. And missed Elizabeth. Have you even moved from that spot? Don't you know what's happening? Captain glanced at him, and then recoiled. Ah! You're an ill sight every time to be true. What do you want? Ezekiel went to him, and told of the devastation on land. It had taken him a week to reach the grace from Alexander's bunker. The plague was wiping out towns and cities as fast as he could travel. Captain had to believe it, considering the source. He took it all in with a depressed horror, and then resignation and a drink. The end of the world. Maybe it's time for that. No! We have to find the others! All of you can gather around me to survive this! Oh, I... No, I don't think I'll be going in for that. I'll just stay here and let what happens happen. Noticing Ezekiel's frustration, he said, Do what you're going to, of course. I can't stop you, but you'll have to carry me every step of the way. Ezekiel conceded once again. Do you have paper and a marker? Captain made a lazy motion at the deckhouse door and returned to his chair. Ezekiel came out later with two notes similar to the ones he'd written for Alexander and gave the same instructions. Then he said, Good luck to you, Noah, and headed for the side. Having given everything a little more thought, Captain said, Oh, ah, uh, before you go, I might have some trouble getting to this place of yours. You see, I've no crew aboard. How many do you need? The Grace sailed well with twenty. She could comfortably house sixty-five. Captain said, I'll need a hundred and thirty or so, without a doubt. He figured they could double up in the bunks. A hundred and thirty? I don't have time for that. I have to find the others. Aye, indeed you do. You, you go on ahead with that. I'll just go ashore and try to find a crew by myself. Ezekiel hated his choices. Fine, I'll need your lifeboat. It sat twenty. Captain almost grinned. Here, let me help you with it. When they had it in the water and Ezekiel had the oars in place, Captain shouted down, Don't bring me only men now. That makes for a dull voyage. Ezekiel didn't respond to that foolishness. There wouldn't be much to choose from anyway. He rode the dark water into glistening ripples on his way toward a blacked-out city under the moon. There, in its deserted alleys, his eyes flashed as they rejected random trails of infection. His perception stretched out through the walls like a searchlight. He saw any life within a hundred yards. When Bauron came upon him, they didn't cast the shining reflections of living people. They had dull, smoldering glows like dead bodies. They were live enough to unravel, though, and weren't much of a threat. Curiously, when he pulled their wren through for the death stroke, it felt as though it came through a sieve. He didn't know what to make of it, and still couldn't spare the time to investigate. His immortals' lives were too important. Ezekiel filled the lifeboat with survivors and rowed them out in slow trips. The delay tortured him. Many of the people he found were so old and feeble that he simply kept them unconscious and carried them because it saved time. Their bodies were soft bags around delicate frames, just a flinch from being crushed in his grip. Captain stood waiting for them on the grace with lanterns in place to light the way. When Ezekiel headed back out to the city, the survivors woke up and wandered around, wondering where they were and how they'd gotten there. One old man came up and said, Excuse me there, Scout. Where'd that Zeke get to? Captain held up his hands as if he didn't know anything, and went around trying to convince them all to lie down. The front of the ship started to look like a field hospital. Every time Ezekiel returned, everyone but Captain fell unconscious, some with the brutal thud of their flesh hitting the deck. It kept them out of the way. Captain wondered if it was possible for them to be injured like that, 
despite being within Ezekiel's power when it happened. It was unpleasant no matter, and played havoc with their memories. Ezekiel's arduous trips continued until a few hours after dawn, when he returned with the last ten, making one hundred and thirty exactly. He could have fit ten more in that boat. Captain didn't want to think about that. Ezekiel glared. That's all of them you asked for. Without a doubt, every one, but I still can't make it all that way without provisions, now can I? Captain had a cargo list prepared that would stock the ship for an impossible journey, for a hundred and thirty. Here, I've written down the things I'll need. Ezekiel's mouth fell open when he looked at the list. He was still gaping when he looked back at Captain. Oh, now, you can improvise on some of the items I've marked, of course. Like this one here. See? Aye, indeed, it's quite a lot. We could go ashore and get it ourselves, but, well... Ezekiel questioned whether it would have been easier to carry the man around after all, or just let him die. No. Too much trouble for one and too valuable for the other. He'd already contemplated whether any of his rare friends would be appropriate for attempts at resurrection, since their loss would be so dear, and had come to the conclusion that thirty years of common love was one thing to sacrifice. Centuries of reliable genius was another. No, he'd no way of knowing if any of the others were still alive. He had to do as much as he could to provide for each one he managed to find. He held up the cargo list with an empty threat. There'd better not be anything else after this! Then he went back down in the lifeboat. It took him two days of constant work to return with everything. Captain didn't drink or smoke in the time between trips. He pretended to be one of the survivors, using their stories to add essential items to the cargo list. Things like goggles, respirators, and bleach. A 51-year-old Andalin was a valuable source of information. When she asked about guns and ammunition, Captain assured her the Grace was already a floating arsenal. She spent some time as a munitions vessel, you see. All the while, Beatrice shouted at them to smoke themselves to death. Smoke yourself to death! Smoke yourself to death! Screech! Whistle. It was disconcerting to everyone but her master. Ezekiel came in from his last run, bringing 200-pound barrels aboard with ease. Though physically tireless, he was emotionally exhausted. This is everything you wanted. Well, almost. Ezekiel reared back with a fearful scowl. More essential items? Captain said, no, no, I have everything I need, not to worry. But this crew, they're old as the hills and there isn't a seaman among them. I'll need them young and strong if I'm to make it out past the third meridian. He tapped himself on the nose. Fine! Ezekiel pitched into a violent trance, eyes rolling back. The sleeping bodies around him began to pop, squelch, and transform, wriggling from the inside like larva. Captain cringed. It was the sound of a classroom cracking its knuckles and squashing grapes by the bucket. It went on for grisly minutes. When Ezekiel was almost done, Beatrice blasted out from her perch on the chair. Rock, smoke yourself to death! The volume of it shocked him out of his trance, and the simmering pops and squelches stopped. Captain turned to smile at her, just in time to witness a burst of Ezekiel's temper. The bird's eyes sucked back into her skull as every living cell in her body split open and separated. She fell in a wet mass of once beautiful feathers. Captain winced and looked away. He'd had Beatrice for years. He couldn't say anything that would make a difference. It occurred to him that every moment near Ezekiel was a moment away from death for almost anyone but him. For him, Ezekiel made life a prison. Out of vague self-criticism, Ezekiel said, You could never love me, could you, Noah? Captain didn't waste any time trying to understand what that meant. He just said, No, indeed, and lit his pipe. After a moment, he offered some flat praise. But you can still be proud of all the good you've done. Ezekiel was on the edge of a personal crisis. All the good I've done? Captain motioned at his new crew. Look at all the lives you've saved from the plague. The lives I've... These? You don't understand anything about life! Captain blew smoke. I could say the same to you. Ezekiel screamed. He couldn't take any more. He dove overboard without another word, and without completing the crew's rejuvenation. That is the end of Chapter 28. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can follow the link at the top of my website, www.williameharlan.com, and purchase the full novel from Amazon in ebook format for 2.99, dollars 
or as a paperback for $12.99. Thanks for listening. Tune in next week for Chapter 29, Mission.